is it recording yes recording there we go hi hey there hi peter how are you very well good to see you again Celine. i hope things are going well yeah it's been a very long time huh it's been almost a year we saw it each other in january haven't we that's right that's right yeah. january time it's flies in the bizarre reality that we're in right now yeah the beginning yes. of this this disastrous year we we were together. <laughs> but it, you know, it kind of speaks to the themes of the movie a little bit in terms of the economic stuff. I, COVID, of course, wasn't a subject and it wasn't something people thought about, but uh, the film would have changed probably if this was also the reality when it was being created. But yeah, it's, yeah. A, it's interesting the challenge that's being posed, particularly to the economy, which, as you remember from the script, is pretty much what you know, the film is ultimately about. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know exactly. It was actually I remember emailing emailing you exactly about this after the COVID happened, and I wrote to you and I said, "Peter, <laughs> right, yeah, <laughs> do you think this is going to change the whole economic system the way you presumed in your film?" I'd hope it at least give people a little bit more insight into the flaws of the system, since yeah, you, know, you have this thing that's stifled people's ability to to interact and obviously economically interact. So it makes the question come up, well, maybe we shouldn't have an economy that requires everyone to interact in this way. And what would the alternatives be? And those are good exactly. questions for people to consider. Uh, I think it's very unfortunate, the suffering that's happening, needless to say, because it, it, it is ultimately needless. It's, you just have to have a different kind of economic structure that can be fortified, that allows for this kind of problem. It knows what to do. That's what a good system does. You know, A good system can adapt. And our economic system is so old, it just can't adapt to this. And you see the suffering systemically. It definitely but, did not adapt to the COVID crisis. I mean- It couldn't, it can't, and it, it, it won't. And that's, that's the, that's, it's unfortunate as well, because after this long period, I haven't seen much conversation in the public sphere about the fundamental problems of the system. Uh, but anyway, we don't, we don't have to jump ahead too much. Yeah. Uh, we, can, we can explore uh, some of these questions that you mentioned. And, um, uh, well, let's start with the name. I mean, we're talking about the Interreflections film mm -hmm. um, right. where I've acted out Alenia Demir, the great, the great role that Peter was so, um, I don't know, offered. Well, you didn't offer it to me, but. <laughs> <laughs> I Actually, I was, I was the casting. lucky one. Oh, yeah, the, well, I was the lucky one because casting was very difficult and it went on for years and I, you know, the film was made over a long period of time, but it wasn't continuously made. I had to stop and break and I wrote a book and did a whole bunch of other things, mm -hmm. but I had cast people earlier on then I ch changed it around. There were at least three different major shifts. Um, and then there, you know, it, it, as you know, and this jumps to your question that you had commented on regarding casting, mm -hmm. uh, it required a certain number of things. It required someone that could digest the information, communicate it in a way that they knew, because it was many, many pages of script. Yeah. Like you had to understand this, and it's not the easiest thing for a lot of people conceptually. Yeah. And the fact that it had to be executed to some degree from memory, but also through a teleprompter or a scenario. And you did a great job with that too, and that combination. Because I think the scenes pull off very well with all of the academics of the future, um, with that that uh, crutch, as it were, because it is a very difficult, you know, body of of script to try and memorize thoroughly. So I thought that was part of the issue that really had to be conquered. Because I, you know, it's, it takes a certain kind of talent to be able to do that, to really pull off that kind of interactive sense of knowing, and when you're actually dealing with a teleprompter situation at times as well. So I thought cool. you did a very good job with that. So I was, yeah, you're the one. <laughs> well, thank uh, and the dynamic, yeah, you're welcome. And the dynamic of you in contrast to the other, other academics of the future was great too, because I had to see some diversity. I didn't want obviously kind of a monotone academic feel. I wanted to keep it organic and not too spectacle either. I chose not to ornament too much when it came to the academics. I wanted to feel timeless in a way. Cause you know, you talk about the future and everyone has this view of you know, purple hair or the Hunger Games or something bizarre that you know you would you ascribe. And I thought that kind of artistic sensibility would get in the way of that particular scene, uh, especially in contrast to all the other scenes, which of course are far more fantastical and fantasy oriented. Yeah, so, I think uh, it really would have. I mean, um, the way you shot it is definitely timeless. I mean, we're, it, it feels like we're in a vacuum when we're being interviewed. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't matter which year, it doesn't matter where in the future we are, but we're, right. we're definitely not here. That's the sense that it, it, it gives us. Really. Right, exactly, yeah. exactly. And, and of course, it contrasts that whole scene contrasts to the, to the other layer 
uh, with John and Simon mm -hmm. in the, the mid-tier future, because for your audience, if they don't know, the film begins, excuse me, it has a structure of basically a modern day fantasy with a character ostensibly named 23. We never knew her name. Yeah, and she undergoes one. this fantasy. What's yeah. that? That's layer yep. one. <laughs> yes, that's right. And then layer two is this sort of a uh, uh, sci-fi fantasy that is kind of the the ultimate structure. It's the it's the satire of the whole film. Mm -hmm. It is the thing that fits the formula of traditional filmmaking with you know the form and the kind of midterm drama and then the whole holistic drama. So if you were to break that middle uh, section out into one single film, it would be pretty traditional in in viewing, um, yeah. which is not what I wanted. I wanted a non-traditional approach. And then the future future, uh, 100 and some 20 years in the future is when uh, that interview with the academics of the future emerges, which reflects back. And that's about hindsight. That's the device that's used with you with you folks in the in the academics of the future. It's about giving the audience a way to see what we're doing now from a place of separation, which I think is a very profound philosophical disposition. You know, you have that old kind of Buddhist notion of witness you yeah. might be familiar with, where you kind of monitor yourself instead of being so engaged in your emotions, you monitor yourself in a separate way. And you're kind of able to see your own you know, cognitive dissonances and, you know, things that you don't like about yourself, perhaps, or things you don't like about society. So they say hindsight is twenty twenty is an old adage. And that's how I built that scene out was to hopefully make people have that sense and hopefully learn, you know. Wow, perfect. I think, I mean, I've read my, uh, well, I only, I didn't only read my part. When I got the script um, for the audition, I had all the academics in, yeah. in there and um, I had to study all of them and I think what you just mentioned the way the script was so complex and the way it was written was so um, interesting and intriguing that I think that's why I really wanted to act out the role that's yeah. what got me interested in it because I get a lot of scripts and I get a lot of auditions in Turkish and in English and most of the time you know they're different motivations for doing an audition is because you like the character or because you like the story or mm -hmm. because you know it might be a good commercial project but um i was specifically looking for something that was abroad while i was in istanbul and i was specifically i still am that's how i like would like to um manage my career is to is to, is to act in not only just projects but in socially influencing you know, pieces of yeah. artwork. So when I read <laughs> the script that I got in my head and I was like, whoa, okay, I need to, I definitely need to get this part. And it was like, I really want to act out in this, in this film. And I was so excited. And um, I remember oh, the initial you. audition I sent you. I didn't read for Eleni. I think I read for, I read, I read a mixture of academics, I think. Um, mm -hmm. I think you did, yeah. I had, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and then, in a way, the, all the academics are sort of one voice, which is also yeah. gives it a unique kind of sense, even though there's clear, subtle differences in character and the way the cast was done, as, we, as I mentioned before. Uh, but it, it is sort of a narrative structure in the sense that you speak, and then it, that's a documentary, effectively, mm -hmm. that's being created from the speech. So it's a unique hybrid of both character and a sort of narrative in a documentary. And I thought you executed that well as is that very well too because it's you don't want it just to be once again a narrow myopic or excuse me a, a narrow monotone sort of unfolding of a narration uh you want there to be some life to it and you really brought great life to it in fact i i will say that i've gotten many compliments on your particular execution of that really um, outstandingly so in compared oh, to you know thank you oh, every, not, i'm not putting down anybody else obviously but just saying uh -huh. a lot of people felt it was very very uh uh there's an energy that you brought to it that was, oh, that was significant you. and it makes it yeah here, especially from you but and by um, the way i i might uh break there's a an idea i've had that since i made the film since it is three different films in one yeah, i might yeah. break them all out into actual shorts and release them independently so oh. what you the film inner reflections is technically the documentary in the film if you remember from yeah, the very exactly, end exactly. so i might make you know a breakout of inner reflections with just the academics and just the the sci-fi layer and maybe the fantasy layer too even though that would be particularly abstract but I'd be at a minimum, I might do that and just put it online, maybe not put it out in any kind of commercial form. And that also, maybe, really, submit, what, oh, yeah. go ahead. Go and maybe ahead. even submit that to film festivals for as shorts, which I think would be more appropriate for most film festivals than a film like this that's three hours long. That mm -hmm. is very, uh, it's a challenge. We live in a very short attention span culture, as you know. 
And I knew when I made this that it would be, <laughs> it would be a, an interesting audience find. You know, who's going to sit there? Most people they have to they have to watch it in sections. And I even thought about breaking it into a series. That was something that someone else recommended, but I didn't want to. I wanted to be, you know, I wanted to keep the integrity of of the form, which yeah. I think actually works very well, even though it's not necessarily for everyone. But uh, oh well. Well, no, I think it will be. It was because this was going to be one of my questions to you. Um, after the documentary series that you've done. Uh, mm -hmm. Zeitgeist, why did you want to switch into a more narrative form in your, well, if we take the whole documentary series as one project in your second uh, filmmaking project? So the first series I did was kind of inadvertent. My first film in 2007, Zeitgeist, very controversial, mm -hmm. uh, was actually an artistic expression that was never meant to be released, believe me. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was actually a performance piece done in New York City because I'm also a musician and I constructed this. And then it became popular, um, again, with no promotion or advertising. It just happened to go viral on the internet before mm -hmm. viral was, was even really a thing uh, in 2007. And then I made a sequel to that in, in trying to figure out what I was doing with my life because I, I didn't, I wasn't planning to be a filmmaker at any point. I was, I worked in film and editing and I did music composition, but music and, and basically uh, classical music, orchestral, off-Broadway stuff, that's what I was doing in New York uh, as, a, as a career pursuit in my, my mid-20s. Um, and then I got derailed by Zeitgeist, so I made two more of those. And by, I guess by 2011, it was such a strange phenomenon I decided I didn't want to continue that brand in terms of the film because I had there was a movement that got started and there was all this activity and a lot of centric stuff came to me, I meaning way too much attention came to me in, in the discussion of social issues. So yeah. much so that I felt like you know people saw me as some kind of leading figure in a in a not so glamorous way. So I wanted <laughs> to pull, pull back from that in a way. Well, it's, it's terrible to be a controversial figure in the public eye because you get attacked so easily from mainstream yeah. figures and it gets exhausting. And, it, and ultimately, I didn't want my films to seem like they represented like a movement because I think you have to have legitimate, if you want to have a social movement that's going to be functional, it has to have legitimate foundation intellectually. So I wrote books for the movement. And by the way, this film in Reflections is based on a book that I wrote, which we can talk about in a second. Um, so I changed the brand in terms of my filmmaking, just for the moment anyway. I, I thought about going back, but I don't know. But anyway, to answer your question, uh, I want to do something completely different. And I didn't necessarily want to do something uh, it's standard. And I, I have an experimental nature. Most of my background, again, in classical music is of an experimental kind. I was very influenced by 20th century, which you call 20th century music, obviously, we're in the 21st century. But you call it that because it's experimental. You're dealing with people like... Um, you know, Ian S. Zanakis and a bunch of names I could rattle on that were deeply influential to me in abstract concepts and how to create abstraction and create vocabulary. And that's what influenced me when I made this film primarily. So it's a musically oriented style, believe it or not, um, in its form. So to answer your question, I just wanted to do something a little bit different and see how it could play out. And I do want to continue this trilogy. It's going to take some time. I'm going to do it a very different way when I continue because the burden of the, the technical requirements was so severe in yeah. this one. And, it, and I didn't have the budget to outsource in the way that most professionals would. In fact, most professionals making low budget films would never even attempt to do what what we just did because yeah. it, it's ludicrous to do a full film based mostly on compositing uh, without a huge team of people in a house so without uh, a huge team it was only you wasn't it oh it was almost mostly. only you no, it's pretty it as far as the i mean i have thousands of hours of labor just me sitting at a computer it's a um, one man show the whole film it, is almost it, a one it, show. And you can feel it you can feel it a little bit i'm not going to put down the film obviously but it is it is a raw film it's not supposed to look great it's supposed to look organic and consistent mm -hmm. and challenge the viewer and I, I i like the way it looks some people see it they, they can't handle it but i like <laughs> i try to tell them to give it give it a chance you know one of the reasons that the style is so uh, raw deliberately is because it really mirrors a stage performance, which is why at the very beginning I have the two male characters, John and Simon in space, they start out with a stage. You remember the theater. Yeah. And you're, of course, there with the academics at the very end to give a circular connection to all three layers uh, in that theater, that final scene before the finale. And, and the stage performance was meaningful to me because when you watch a, a stage performance, you have to suspend your disbelief. You create the environment like you're reading a book because it's a stage. And that's the way this film kind of approached itself as a whole. 
Um, you look at the scenes, people know it's not a real scene. They know it's a composite. And it's, it's up to them to decide whether they want to suspend their disbelief and look at what the scene means, or they want to be upset that it doesn't look the way that they're, they're used to seeing film. So I hope that makes sense. There's a lot yeah, of layers. Is that like a choice? That. It does. It does make sense. Is that a choice you on purposefully gave to the audience? You wanted to give to the audience on purpose? Yeah, well, I mean, I knew that, first of all, it's just practicality that why should I perfect something in a Hollywood style way for a particular scene to make it absolutely perfect, which I could do, you know, if I had enough time, but because that's my background, I used to do this professionally in advertising, believe it or not. I did composite work all the time uh, with much bigger budgets and so on. But I just realized that it wasn't worth it. It's not worth having that final level of perfection when your goal is to be poetic and your goal is yeah. to be informative. So, you know, but anyway, so I, I've deviated from your question a little bit. No, that that's great. That was, I'm learning things that I actually didn't know about the film. So, um, yeah. There's a lot of symbology. I'm going to be putting out a interreflections deconstructed video fairly soon, just to explain at least on the basic level what all the symbols mean. Because no, very few get it. No one goes through these scenes and really understands how much is inside each of them. Mm -hmm. um, in the term, in terms of symbology, uh, it has to kind of be analyzed like you you look at a piece of art over and over again. Um, but I've actually gotten a couple of requests. I've gotten messages from people saying they. Um, they would hope that you would make subtitles. There, okay. Yeah, there are subtitles pending. Um, mm -hmm. It is a little complicated with the distributor because you have to go through this professional, you know, route. You can't just crowdsource them, which is a lot easier, frankly. It's also very expensive for a film like this, thousands and thousands of dollars to do a subtitle. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it, they are coming. And I might actually put a call out to people through um, through one of the online subtitling networks. To, I'll put the film up and ask if anyone wants to subtitle it, and then I get it reviewed. And hopefully at least the Vimeo upload, because that's the most accessible one globally, mm -hmm. that one can have the subtitles. Yeah, I'm working on that. That would be perfect. Hopefully. I think one of the, one, yeah. it was one student, one of the fans, um, they wrote to me and it's like, can you, can you, it was really cute. Uh, can you tell Sir Peter, we, well, I don't speak English, it was in Turkish. And he said, I, I, I need some subtitles and I really want to watch the film. And I responded okay. to him and I said, I'll tell him, don't worry. <laughs> yeah, good. I mean, I'm working on that for sure. Good, yeah, I'll, good. I'll tell him, I'll, I'll message him. He'll be happy. Cool. Um, well, another question I want, I want to ask you was for the, the, the trilogy. Because so you are thinking of going on with the second and the third sequels, right? I'm planning on it. I, I know it's it's a complex project and I am going to make some more simplistic films, documentaries particularly, because documentary filmmaking is far easier than something like this. Uh, it doesn't take as much money or manpower. In the meantime, right. I'm going to do that. But the concept of the film has already been thought out. Excuse me, the concept of the entire trilogy has already been thought out. And I definitely want to figure out how to do it, but I can't do it the same way, as I mentioned before. The composite style just isn't in the cards for the labor that's required. So it will be different. It will be different. I, you know, there's there's a new kind of trend in media where sequels or, or TV series, particularly, they, they move from season to season, then they change their cast and they change their content. They change the style entirely, yet it's still a, the same film sequel or it's still the fame, same TV series. So in the sequels, there's a good chance I'm going to change up a lot of the, the core narrative characters, but I'm probably keeping the academics of the future because that's, that's yeah, what's the easiest <laughs> to do. I might, I might add some new academics too and some other characters as well, but you know, it's, it, I'm gonna mix it up to a degree, but yeah, I won't, I won't go into any detail about what the technical level, excuse me, what the stylistic concept okay. is and the technical level, but the, what I plan to do with these future versions, I think is, I'll say this, it'll, be mirror, it'll mirror more of a stage performance style and more of an opaque quality that's based more on character establishment than this one was mm -hmm. and more on uh, more on uh, not traditional not traditional story structure but more on a um I, i'm sorry i'm being abstract here the series of vignettes in, in inner reflections get they get collapsed as as the film progresses so I'll, I'll i'll say that so you have the three layers in this one in the second film there's only two layers the academics and then the, oh. the battle between concordia and the mainland and then by the time of the third film it all gets collapsed to only the battle oh. so that's how it progresses and by the third one that's when society actually transforms if i had you know investors and a budget that was more significant i could do a whole lot more with this i've also considered by the way uh, pitching it as a tv series itself because if you had the island people against the mainland establishment you know that typical traditional 
uh, almost cliche duality, but it's based on real themes about what we're doing in humanity, with humanity and society and sustainability and so on. I think that'd actually be a really fun thing to break out too. Okay. So I've, I've structured that a little bit and I know some people in the industry, I might you know, give that a shot as well. It would be, yeah. yeah. Um, interesting. Some kind so of some kind of conversation happen, has yeah. to hit the media that's more significant. We don't see anything in the general media that really no. deals with these themes. If they do, it's always post-apocalyptic. You know, the media, uh, the tendency is to be fantastical, and of course, to have grand conflict, which is what you know most f film and television ultimately you know seeks because that's what creates an audience and keeps an audience. That's the tension. Um, but you don't see the themes that are appropriate that to this point in time. So I, I just continue with that push. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that sorry, if I'm a little, I hope, sorry if I'm a little. Yeah. No, I, I hope I hope that gets the get the, the green light. I mean, I think that'd be perfect. Um, no, I was interested because um, I knew the filmmaking process was quite difficult for this one. Um, we were in touch during our, after the in the post production period, and I was actually at one point afraid, you know, that you might not <laughs> consider going on with the second. And the, and the third sequel. Well, I've I've joked in the past that, you know. The, yeah, when it was on email, kind of I was like, oh my God, he's so exhausted. <laughs> well, that's what I mean. Yeah. I, I'd have to do it differently. I couldn't do it the same way. It's either A, somehow I magically get a big budget to do it, or at least a semi larger budget than what I had. And mm -hmm. I could actually hire a professional team uh, yeah. with, like, significantly, not just freelancers and contractors that I had to use for this one. Yeah. Um, uh, or B, I do it in a very different way, as I mentioned. And I think it's feasible to actually do a very minimalistic form to communicate the ideas, keep the avant-garde style. Uh, but I, again, I don't want to go into yeah, that. It's too, no. it's too speculative at this point. But, but I have every intention to answer your question to try and move forward Good. with it. I mean, but as you as you know, a film like this is abstract. It's not the most commercially viable project that someone puts out there. It, it breaks most of the norms. So I have to keep that in, take that into account as well. well a lot of people are looking looking forward to the film. Though. You, there are a lot of, I mean, I'm going to say fans, but followers sure. of your ideas and your philosophies and 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 the the take you have on our society around the around the world. I mean, I remember uh, in the gala in L.A., people mm -hmm. flew in from Australia to. To see yeah, there are a lot the of people. Film. So, yeah. I mean, for online platforms, I think that might be very suitable to to sell to the whole world. You know, sure. Why not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think it sounds feasible. I mean, if I, I was an so. online platform, I would <laughs> I would give it the green light, but I'm not. Um, well, what about what about the the new world that we have in the film? I actually wanted to ask you if you think. Uh, practically and logically that our society will develop in that way towards that that society that you've created uh, in your film? What, what do you see the chances of that being? I think that the world is going to have to transform one way or another. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's, we're learning the hard way right now. Mm -hmm. And I, I just can't imagine. Like we always that, have. but I know, exactly. It's just the, the point of no return will eventually come where we've destabilized things to such a degree that it's just so transformative. And some would argue we're already there now in terms of you know, the pollution crisis and climate destabilization and so on. But as I write in my book that the film is based on the new human rights movement, so people can remember that title. And I would comment that the, I paired this deliberately. My book is very academic and straightforward. And the film, of course, is very avant-garde and stylistic. And they actually work together. I think they feed each other because I'm able to communicate aesthetically in one way and then intellectually in another. But if you read the book, I make the case that this kind of a society based on this kind of economy is so foundationally unsustainable that there's no way you can correct it internally. You have to start a transition away from it, which is a very large subject to, to the effect I can summarize it. First, the analysis that our economy is based on people constantly consuming, and that drives labor demand and hence circulates money, purchasing power. So at that very foundational level, we literally live in a world where everyone's trying to sell something to someone else and everyone has to participate by working and submitting to get money to spend back into the system. And it has no relationship to nature, it has no conservative properties. The more you buy and sell, the more you throw away, the better for the economy. So naturally that's unsustainable by all definition, even a five-year-old could understand that, but yet that's how the entire world functions. So what do, what do you learn from that? You learn, well, what are the properties of nature that make things homeostatic, that actually create you know, longevity that we can rely upon? What can we learn from the systems of nature? 
and system science is a big interest of mine. I studied a lot of people that have tried to analyze this problem. You know, biomimicry is a concept where you try to mirror nature. And we've learned a great deal about how natural systems work and have evolved. And we apply that same rationale to human behavior. And I, I will end this brief summary by saying the biggest argument I get from people is that, well, humans are X, Y, Z. Oh, we're our nature, human nature won't allow for us to be more collaborative or sustainable or satisfied. We people just want to buy and consume. We're ravenous. So we've created this mythology that really pollutes the the uh, dialogue because yeah. people just think we're so corrupted. I mean, if this is the only way that we can live, we might as well shoot ourselves right now because we're not going to be here much longer. So it's uh, it's frustrating that we are more collaborative than than we give ourselves credit for, right? Well, the, if you're if you think from a sociological perspective, it's it's pretty straightforward. We live in a society that demands you to compete, so you're in competition with all other actresses. You're I'm in competition trying to sell a movie. I everyone's competing at all times to try and survive or to gain the status and notoriety that allows them to survive and prosper as well. Uh, so you the social system literally forces you to be competitive. And yeah. it doesn't have to be that way. You know, there's plenty of historical societies that have lived like pre, pre Neolithic um, era, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, hunter gatherer tribes, which very few exist anymore, but they did exist in the 20th century in the Amazon. And they were studied much, excuse me, they were studied greatly by people like Margaret Mead and others come to realize that they have communal sensibilities and sustainable approaches and a basic spiritual connection to the earth that allows them to exist without some heavy footprint and without the value system disorder that so many people possess today. Materialism, vanity, you know, con con hyper consumerism, you know, all of that uh, stuff that literally we've manifest in ourselves because of the social structure generation after generation. So this isn't natural is my point. What we're doing is, is just simply not natural. And I, yeah, <laughs> I think really all anyone is. has to do is look out the window to see how unnatural it is. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, well, when you mentioned um, saying how the economic system and the way people just live to buy things and sell things has no correlation to the nature, it has no correlation to people themselves. I mean, like when I talk to my friends or my colleagues, uh, my close family, and we when we sit and talk about what we want to do with our lives, like I'm one of those people who knew, what, I, I guess I, I knew what my vocation was or what my area was when I was really young. Um, mm -hmm. in my lifetime, which is, I guess it's, 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 it's a luck. I don't know, but um, I knew that I wanted to write and I knew I wanted to act because I knew I wanted to tell people about their feelings. And then I knew I wanted to write because I wanted to tell them about certain, certain areas of life that would, that would benefit society. But mm -hmm. most of the time when, when I discuss it with people, a lot of them don't know what they want to do with themselves and they think about buying and selling and then profiting just in order to make some money and that's the way they think of themselves related to that concept instead of thinking of themselves and then getting it finding a place for who they are within the system they think of who they are according to the system first right so that's I, 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 yes, I completely What's agree. Uh, people become agents of what the system requires and their yeah. values and, and yeah. uh, even their entire belief systems sort of become, you know, manipulated by that. Um, it's, it's a terrible, uh, it's a short term thinking problem. So if yeah. you have a whole society that is struggling from paycheck to paycheck and, you know, just trying to make ends meet, which is the vast majority, even in the rich societies, how are they going to be concerned about the pollution crisis? How are they going to care? Who has the time to adjust? And, and they're certainly not going to stop, you know, the general. I mean, look at COVID in the United States. The United States is a particular character. It has a particular culture. Mm -hmm. And the selfishness of the American society not to do the most basic things to stop the spread, which has been killing 3,000 people a day here, it's, it goes to show the, the problem in the short term thinking, because everyone wants the, this kind of short term satisfaction mm -hmm. and they, they negate any kind of long term concern. And I think that pretty much defines the characteristics of the of the way the world works. I mean, a CEO 
is there to make money for their shareholders and maybe get a big bonus when they leave. Their roles are temporary. So they're not going to, you know, they're not going to think twice in most cases to do something that will make lots of money, even if it creates pollution or it harms people or it, or it creates a sweatshop somewhere. They can, they, they just can't really, I mean, there's exceptions, of course, you have people that have moral and ethical beliefs that transcend those uh, incentives, but it's, it's few and far between because no one's really doing it. There's, I mean, everyone tends to reward the ruthlessness. If you look closely, you know, we, we, we put people on a pet, look at the president of the United States. We, this person has literally been rewarded to be president and a billionaire supposedly. Uh, and he has the word, he has the, he's a despicable uh, person, like as despicable as they come in his value system, uh, completely selfish, self-centered, arrogant. So, it, but it serves as a symbol to, of what the society really is. Like we've created someone like Donald Trump in America. He's a manifestation of the value system disorder, not only of American society, but really the social system of laissez-faire capitalism uh, that we have been pushing across the world and neoliberalism and so on. So really yeah. of every society, don't you think? I mean, oh, it's, it's, it's just so worse so in the US. It's just worse in the US yeah. as far as I'm concerned. They're yeah. all a manifestation of the society at the end of the day, since yes. they're able to to walk up the ladder for for such a long time, they've been manifested. It's true. Yeah, we get this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It, it's a global problem because the same system is polluting everyone. Yeah. And and any any attempt historically to try something new, and I don't defend things like Soviet communism because uh, it had a terrible it had terrible ramifications. But people forget that Soviet communism started off with actually good intent by the people, the organic revolution that occurred. And it was completely and utterly attacked by Western capitalist powers to the extent where these, these countries were, were being sanctioned and blockaded off. They couldn't get the resources required and they really weren't allowed to go through a learning curve to try and manifest something new. They were shut down, which goes to show the, the uh, aggressiveness of this kind of thinking where the agents of our capitalist society, they see everything else as a threat and it's a very unique sociological phenomenon. I mean, I really believe that we could have had a, I mean, that's again, in, going back to interreflections, that's what happens in the third film is you have the island that is developing advanced technologies that enable other countries on the mainland to go off the grid from the economic globalized world and be completely sustainable. Because as I write about, um, and I don't wanna go into all this too much, but that is kind of the trend of what's happening as you know, your home can now be off the grid if you really want it to be with solar panels and so on. We're in this preliminary stage where we can be independent in a way and revitalize community. And the way I see it is that eventually communities are gonna have to come back and they're gonna have to take care of each other with more advanced means. We're not talking about just you know simple garden here or you know, people volunteering here, but you used advanced mechanisms that we were able to produce now uh, through the beautiful advancement of science and technology that enable people to live in a decent quality of life that's sustainable, that isn't, you know, just, you know, living in complete minimalism, but enables them to be sustainable because they have the technological means to do so that doesn't take much footprint to produce. So that's how the, that's how the transition happens in the movie is that's the, uh, so I don't want to go, that's kind of a giant spoiler, but that's the battle <laughs> though is my point. The I battle is still, yeah, well, that's the battle. So the, the people on the mainland, like the, the Simon character, uh, if he, whatever his representation representation might be in that third film, whatever it is, uh, they are fighting this island because they don't want the island to 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 work. They don't want the other people to get this technology because they want to keep hegemonic control in the exact same way mm -hmm. that these the power that powers that be have fought all other possible alternatives over the past few centuries. You try to do something different on this planet. There's a subculture of people that will come after you because they want to make sure capital has free reign, meaning they want to have to be able to buy and sell, you know, all the resources that you have, colonialism, globalization. You know, in my second film, Zeitgeist Addendum, I interview a self-proclaimed economic hitman, and his name's John Perkins, very honest guy. He was hired to go and basically manipulate leaders to get them to turn over their resources, particularly leaders that were trying to do something socialistic as it were. Mm -hmm. So in the global South, in Latin South America, you know, all these coups, Allende, it just goes on and on. If you look closely at what they were trying to do, they were trying to do something different for their societies. They were yeah. trying to evade the, the terrible toxic nature of this capital driven uh, economic reality and actually you know, create ground up social programs, create, you know, anyway, I won't go on that tangent but you see my point <laughs> yeah. i do yeah. Yeah. um we were talking about just um a couple of minutes ago well covid this this reality that we we live in now and um 
I wanted you, I wanted to kind of um, press on the subject that how this COVID crisis did in the beginning uh, show the problems that we have in our system, but but the talk subsided really quickly. I yeah. mean, um, especially the 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 flaws of the economic system and the social system was was very obvious when the COVID started about, especially with with the rates of death and 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 where the the rates of death was higher within a society uh, said a lot about that society. But but the talk really subsided a lot. Um, what do you think the future? with this COVID crisis is with, with filmmaking and, and the society, is it gonna impose some change or have, I, we, have we failed this test as well? I, I'd say, I mean, I got enormous feedback and emails and messages when COVID happened because in my kind of subculture, everyone thought, well, this might be it. This might be- I, I emailed we'll you about that. I, I said, I know. we're going I, 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 I stood away from that because I wanted to see what would happen. And I just kind of watched and I'm, I don't have any powers. It's not like I could really do much, but I, I just watched and I was very disappointed to see how the conversation quickly turned into all sorts of civil rights issues and things where people missed the point. And the overall controversy has nothing to do with the fact that our economy is completely incapable of dealing with this type of crisis. Instead, yeah. everyone just got up in arms about all this other stuff. So to answer your question, first of all, about film, I don't think it's going to have too much of an effect on the way films are made. I, because, uh, it's going to basically return to normal, more or less. It, you know, we're going to have this maybe another year or so. And but I will think I will say that there's going to be a difference in the way people behave. I think, in in the long term, uh, particularly the labor system. I think a lot of more a lot more people will be working from home, and, and a lot of companies have realized they don't need to have an office space, which I think is a good thing. But it's all you know, it's passive. But going back to the issue of well, you know, what did this mean in system science? There's a concept called viability which simply means that for a system to work, it has to be able to, to uh, in, excuse me, it has to be able to adapt or take into account in, information that it's not used to, things coming into the system that are foreign. And the most viable system is one that can adapt and maneuver and account. And that's why nature is so brilliant because you can throw lots of things at it, or even the human body is a better example. The human body, you can, you can you know, poison yourself. Your body has this incredible ability to kind of over override it to a certain degree, with our immune system or just, just the way that our body acclimates. And there's been a lot of study on that, you know, people that drink their entire lives and somehow are still alive. You know, just, it's incredible what, what the body can do because it's an extremely viable system because evolution has made it so. But our economy being so old and born in a time where no one had any understanding of, of nature or ecology or, or what it means, where the entire economy is, you know, just looks at the earth as an inventory, just none of that stuff has registered with people until, you know, basically now, what you see is an unviable system. It can't account for the fact that in a COVID reality, people are going to have to maintain distance. That's just what the most basic public health requirement is, which means that you lose economic interaction, which goes to show that maybe we shouldn't have a system that's based on that kind of economic interaction explicitly, where you know we had a 30% drop in GDP in the United States. That's an enormous drop of, of sales, 30%. Um, that's, that's like Great Depression level. Um, and it, it's just not necessary if you had an economy that actually was viable and could take that kind of thing into account. So that's what I learned. Well, that's what was, excuse me, ever apparent from COVID. But, you know, I'm going to give some more talks soon. And I, of course, I run a podcast and stuff. And I brought these things up in passing. But yeah. uh, I hope to reframe this when things settle down and when people can actually come into theaters again. And I hope to do a, a talk on this whole subject and re re revisit um, the importance of what COVID means yeah. in terms of the economic revelation. Because even the most notable economists that I follow, notable philosophers and, and, and public thinkers, no, one, no one's said anything in this regard. I don't see anyone debating the economy. It's, it's really unfortunate. We kind of missed the opportunity in a way. Uh, this should have been the most public conversation. Like, why can't our economy handle this, pro this problem? Yeah, or our social yeah. structure, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. But you, you have podcasts every week or every month, is it? It's every week, generally. Sometimes I have to skip a week because of complexity. But yeah, okay. that podcast so, is called Revolution Now. No, yeah, besides yeah. the film, you have Revolution Now, your podcast, and then mm -hmm. you have the book, uh, New Human Rights Movement, correct? The New Human Rights Movement, that's right. Yes. Yeah, if anyone, yeah. anyone that watches Inner Reflections, even though it's not translated into too many languages, uh, but uh, I do encourage Maybe it will be to... after the film. Hopefully. <laughs> It'll be fun to have it in Turkish, yeah. <laughs> It'll be really fun to have it in Turkish. Um, yeah. 
but um, no, I, I've read the script. I had a, I had a, a lot of fun reading the script. I was actually quite um, intimidated uh, before I came into the callback because I was trying to memorize the oh, whole right. thing, the whole academics. I, I had the script of the whole academics, which is like- I remember that. You did a good job trying- Was it, was it four? I'm, I'm one of them, but there's four academics characters, right? Right, right. Or five, is it five or there's four? There's four. 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 Yeah, so I was trying to memorize all of them. And right before I came into the comic, I was like, oh my God, what am I going to do? There's no way I'm going to memorize all of them. <laughs> and then you told me there's a teleprompter and I was like, okay, now yeah. there's a chance I might get this part. <laughs> yeah, it, it all worked out very well. But I'll let you know when I uh, output the the short film version of it. I, I think that's going to be a lot of fun to do because I can add a little bit more content to it. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, the conversation continues. No, the 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 writing is brilliant. Um, definitely. Thanks. It's it's it was. Um, I'm pretty good at memorization as an actress, but it was quite difficult because it jumps from it. It, it has a lot of uh, subtext and a lot of um, ideas within just one paragraph. So. Yeah. Um, it took a long time to write that particular section. I think I had at oh, least okay. 500 pages of notes that had to be consolidated mm -hmm. to make that work. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I was happy with the execution for sure. And you have a very peculiar language as well. Does I suppose. Do that in your writing? Oh. I, mean, um, I think you have a language, specific language um, of your own. I suppose. <laughs> I've, been, I've been accused of being wordy uh, and trying to you know, not be too verbose. Yeah. or using words that no one understands. Um, um, it's kind of frustrating. You, you feel like you have to dumb things down. Um, well, but I do my best. Choice. You don't have to, right? That, that's a choice. Sure, but after after years of experience of giving public talks and people you know reading things I've written and complaining that they don't, don't understand, people don't like, understand. You eventually you eventually try to acclimate. You know, um, it's not. I think it's just the fact that people live in a different educational reality. Uh, people don't read as much and they just watch things. It's well, more you're, you you might be above average smart, so maybe that's. <laughs> <laughs> who knows? Who knows? Uh, uh, no, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think a lot of people would would say that. I mean. Um, it might be a little bit difficult for, you know, the rest of us to decipher all the information that is embedded within just, you know, one paragraph. So. Sure. Yeah. Well, I know I, I do that. Uh, sorry. What's that? I know I have to work on it. I took notes. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you taking the time to to follow through with oh, that. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, ultimately, at the end of the day, as a as a creative person, which I kind of fall back on, I know I, I have this persona as you know, a writer and, and kind of a social movement person. Mm -hmm. And it's all about, you know, revolution or whatever, but I still at the heart of an artist. And that's kind of what keeps me not as frustrated as I probably, <laughs> I probably would be. So I still maintain a lot of artistic and abstract interests in music and so on. Yeah. I've even produced, you know, live performance pieces that people can see. Um, I had a media festival called the Zeitgeist Media Festival running for a couple of years and I did these large stage performances a few times and I really love all that and, and going back to the, orig the original Zeitgeist that again that was a stage performance so I kind of keep that in my vocabulary too when I approach any of this so in other words that's there's an experimental element that I just keep kind of trying to think about it and Inner Reflections is definitely the most notable of that in terms of you know a larger project but I'm going to keep doing other things as well trying to find new avenues, new multimedia concepts, just new abstractions. Yeah. I think that the beauty of the arts is it just kind of sneaks behind the ego of people. You can communicate things in the arts that you can kind of get away with things, I should say, that don't offend people as much or it forces them to think differently or it makes them most importantly think that they've realized something themselves as opposed to something that's been imposed upon them. And I think that's one of the things about Inner Reflections. It's not a domineering film. It's not sitting there and beating you over the head like a documentary. It's yeah. trying to sort of present a, 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 an environment mm -hmm. where people can kind of be in that environment and they sort of realize things uh, in an in individualistic way, if that makes any sense. And I think that's a powerful way to communicate. Uh, I feel that especially in my experience, because it's if you're talking about social theory and philosophy, people think you're imposing. They say, well, how, how do you know what I want? Oh, uh, why do you want to impose your your ideas on me? Why do I why should I live like you or what you think should happen? So you got to you have to diffuse that because it's a common reaction. They, they miss the point about it being a philosophical, grounded, reasoned, inferential thing where you're explaining why, you know, the world should be what it is due to sustainability and, and, and uh, you know, justice and all of that. 
But in order to circumvent that negative reaction of being imposed upon, uh, yeah. that's why I, I use the subtraction. And I'd be curious to see how well that plays out. I haven't had, I've been kind of, the past two months, I've been so busy with other things because I was so bogged down with the film. And now I'm just trying to reorganize my life and you know, get back to you know, some kind of normality. Um, but I, I look forward to like about a year after all this to see what kind of revelations people have come to with the film, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, definitely. Yeah. Um, but you meant, do you think the digital platforms will help you go with the more experimental side? I mean, you know, there's there are new digital platforms in Turkey and there's been a lot of advantages and disadvantages with them. Like, do you mm -hmm. think there'll be more advantage to, to this side of filmmaking or? I mean, it's, it's, it's hit or it's give or take. I mean, <laughs> I'll, I'll be honest. It, each platform kind of messes up the film a little bit because there's different encoding processes. Oh. And then and then the the nature of digital expression through through flat screen television, I don't know if you've noticed this, but it just looks awful. Like the the in most cases the, the way the technology is being created cheaply is it just doesn't represent. So I think there's a drawdown to the quality and I would agree with that. And a lot of other people have commented on that way bigger than I am. It's a, it's just a kind of unfortunate that uh, there's no standardization of this technology, the encoding, the, the color processes, everyone has a certain novelness, different countries. Um, so anyway, that's one general technical flaw that I think is worth pointing out. And to encourage technology to, you know, these companies start to work together better. You know, the fact that you have different systems of television still to this day, PAL and NTSC, uh, it's, I mean, it's less common, of course, in the, in, the, in the digital realm as it used to be. But anyway, that's another complaint. <laughs> uh, but generally speaking, obviously, it brings films into people's homes rapidly. And, yeah. you know, you have all this content. So there's nothing wrong with that. You know, it's a little overwhelming, frankly. I mean, the, the, the democratization of filmmaking, just like music, you know, back in the day when Led Zeppelin wanted to make an album, they had to pay a million dollars in the 70s to do it. And that now a kid in his basement kind of record an album on his computer. So you have this exceptional just overflow of content. Anybody with an iPhone can technically make a movie. And for better or for worse, I mean, I don't think it's a bad thing at all, but it's just an overwhelming amount of content at the same time. So there's something to be said for that in terms yeah. of how we filter uh, how to see content, any of this. Right? We yeah. don't, I just realized that, that we don't. I mean, with <laughs> yeah. the digital stuff and with, you know, for my writing in my acting career, the more work I, get from the digital platforms it's been well it's been great because there are there aren't concerns of certain rules that we have in the mainstream media mm -hmm. and then so my expectation was to get more you know innovative content than we would have in 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 the mainstream me media but then just recently i realized that you know the more what's happening is we get all the content there is instead yeah. of something that's been thought out instead of something that's being a synthesis of a process it's just everything and yeah. i realize that people actually watch it right. so <laughs> we do watch <laughs> all content there is the good and the bad yeah. i don't know what that says about our nature but or filmmaking but it's it it speaks to how we filter in general when it comes to this overwhelmingness. Um, I guess you kind of rely on back to like the for example consuming economy, right? Right. Well, I mean, my for example, I wrote a book and I was debating whether I should get it prof professionally published or to just do it myself because I've generally been completely independent. And what you realize is that there's only in the publishing because everyone there's so many books. I mean, if you were to just do a, a chart of how prolific writing has been especially with you know, Amazon and the way they allow anyone to write and get published through their system and other organizations like that. Uh, you have to have some way to filter it. So I was like, okay, I got to get it published professionally uh, be just because I need that filter because people will look at you better because if you're just a self-published person, they don't take you seriously. And, I get, and the same thing could be said for this film and my use of Gravitas Ventures that, that has released it, my distributor. I said to myself, I could just release this myself because it's just, you know, people, most people watch things online anyway, yeah. um, or they, you know, get it through, um, yeah, it is, if you're connected to the internet, technically you can watch anything. You don't need a Netflix and so on if you, if you really think about it. But if you're on Netflix, it's a filter. If you're distributed by something that's notable, it's a filter. So that's kind of where the filtration comes in in terms of this overwhelming amount of content that's being put forward. But I, I, the jury's kind of out on it all, I think. Uh, who's to say better for worse? Obviously, you want the democratization there more than anything else, but it is overwhelming at the same time. 
I know that COVID has made people hunker down and I've seen an enormous number of statistics come forward from prior projects that I never thought would have life anymore just because people have nothing else to do. So they're, I guess that's good for us, right? Yeah, that is People, awesome. people are gonna be watching whatever we're doing because everyone's watching something because in their, in their lockdown. But yeah, it's well, it's good for us as long as we can shoot. I mean, in the, in the first way, we weren't able to shoot or produce anything at all. So Right. So let me ask you, uh, you had mentioned the audition process. Um, uh, when you when we did the actual shoot, did you feel comfortable with it? Like in the, in the execution? Was. Did you oh, like, did you feel good. you felt satisfied after it was done that it was you know, like, yeah. OK, good. Yeah. That's that's good. Yeah, I, was, I was very happy with the process. Um, I was very excited. I mean, coming in, but I had prepared uh, myself and the teleprompter was a lot of help. Uh, it was yeah. my first time using the teleprompter, so I hope I did a good job with that. Well, so that's amazing because at your audition, you were one of the few that instantly was able to execute the teleprompter, especially since English is a second language. I thought that was very impressive. Oh, um, yeah. yeah. That was you my first have... time ever seeing a teleprompter. It was the callback. That's impressive. Because <laughs> wow. it takes it takes a little bit of effort to learn how to do that and not, I mean, watch any terrible Saturday Night Live episode and you can see them struggling to read all these cue cards <laughs> and it's so distracting. Um, uh, but yeah, it's a hard thing to do. But and then the initial screening of the film, I had I wanted to apologize to you and everyone, which I think I did because the, the oh. film just wasn't it wasn't done. Oh. The film was not finished. <laughs> there was all sorts of things on the screen. Anyway, it just felt bad about that. No, don't worry. The yeah. film gives people so much to think about that I don't think anyone even noticed yeah. it was exactly done or, or or not. I mean, you yeah. were probably the only one who re knew the details and realized that it wasn't actually done. But, sure. Yeah. Well, there were a few actual glitches, like literal technical glitches, because the film is so long. You can only I, mean, I couldn't sit there and watch the whole thing yet again because I was processing up to the last minute. Yeah. But, uh, that that speaks just to uh, the the strain that was created through the through the technical uh, editorial process. But yeah, yeah. But no, we did it. We did it. It's done. <laughs> and I think you weren't there, were you, in the very beginning? What do you mean? Like I was there. No, you were there. You were doing something, right? You were in the back. You were still organizing, or I was so tired. I had been up for days trying to. No, get that that's thing what you told me. Yeah. I, I don't think. I think I was just in the back of the back, you just slept. Kind of bewildered. Well, you hadn't slept for how many days? It was about three days. I mean, it was two to three days because yeah. there was so many issues that were happening trying to hit that deadline. Uh, but that's that's a whole nother conversation of just you know 15 hour days trying to get that thing yeah uh, no i bet which isn't, I bet. which isn't the way it should have been i i felt really guilty as i said um because i cut it so close trying to get the the best you know render at that time out yeah. but uh but yeah i'm glad you came i really appreciate you coming to i that. was very I happy to be a part of that i was very oh, happy and you. it was right before lockdown i mean it was at the end of january and i mean i didn't know that we were going to be in lockdown that yeah um, so actually, yeah. good thing I didn't stay for February. Um, right. I came here and I, and I went to the border actually for for the refugee crisis here. I did a documentary uh, right right after um, our screening, and then the five days after I went came back home to Istanbul. We were in lockdown okay. for like two three months. So right, yeah, you would have been stuck here. <laughs> and, and it was my only chance of having a gala because since COVID hit, we weren't able to go to film festivals or right. have, a, have a proper release. But, but you just mentioned to me that we might, right? There's good news on that. I, I think an independent release. I don't think I would involve a distributor for that, but just a, basically a nonprofit, independent theatrical release. Like if, you know, in, in Istanbul, if it was translated and there was a, a small theater that I could be in touch with, and my company could just rent it out just yeah. outright and then promote it in Istanbul. I yeah, would probably target places. What's that? There's a company I work with. Um, there's a very, uh, there's a very well-known actually alternative company where it's not a commercial company, but they take films like this and then they show it. The, their name is actually, if you translate it's alternative cinema. Oh, wow. Okay. And then, That's and good I to know. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, who knows, it's going to be, many many more months before that's possible but hopefully there'll be some momentum i'll know fairly soon if we have any luck with the streaming services the actual excuse me accounted uh, individual streaming services like netflix and so on because all that's on the table still in terms of pitching of inner reflections um mm -hmm. but i'm not I'm, you know, I'm crossing my fingers but those most of the big ones now like netflix i had all three of my prior films on netflix but it was a different point in time 
where they weren't as big and they weren't doing their own independent content. Mm -hmm. So they, you're kind of in competition with all their individual content on Netflix now. Oh, I, um, I assume I assume Netflix is just as large in in uh, Turkey as it is in the States. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be nice if that that pulls through, but we'll see. That they seem to cool. like me over there, but I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, that, that, would, that would be probably the best thing that could happen for this film is to be on a reputable streaming service, whether it's Apple TV or Netflix or or um, Hulu and some other ones like that, because they have they have their own built in audiences. What's to that? get access to the film from anywhere in the world, if if that was the case. I'm sorry, say it again. Um, it would be very easy to get access to the film with subtitles from anywhere in the world in whatever language if, if that were to happen. Well, you can get, I mean, the access is still, if any, anyone that has a computer, of course, can have access to it, but there are pockets and niches mm -hmm. where people, you know, people that watch Netflix, they just watch Netflix. They don't really yes. do much else. They, they, they look at everything that Netflix has. So you just have a built-in audience, that's all. That's true. So, but how is uh, professional work going for you there? Are you still doing stuff or are you, are you more or less hungry? Um, I am. I am. Um, I'm on a digital series right now. We're waiting to get, go on set, um, but we're in lockdown, so it's been a, a bit difficult. It's What's it's, the series? Uh, um, well, I can't tell you. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Right, fine. It, it hasn't <laughs> been. Okay, I can tell okay. you privately. That's but, fine. Yeah. Um, no, it's, it's, it's a very interesting. It's um, actually it's a very uh, nice character. She's uh, quite difficult to deal with and she's alternative and um, it takes place in a neighborhood around here. It's, it's a neighborhood series. It's about uh, families of relationships that happen within this one neighborhood. So I'm okay. very excited about that. And then, oh, cool. yeah, and then I do writing, as you know. I've been working yeah. on, my, on my screenplay. So it's nice. all good. It's just uh, we can't go outside, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you in well, lockdown luck. right now? You are. I'm sorry? You're in lockdown right now? Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't know it. Um, everyone, I said, as I said before, everyone's very defiant here in the United States. So here in Los Angeles, you go out, it kind of looks normal, um, mm -hmm. which is terrible because the hospitals are filling up, we're running out of ICU beds and so on. Yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, I've been locked down for years, Celine. So I've, I've been doing this film, you know, because I it's it's like nothing surprising to me. I'm oh, locked down. Oh, that's fine. I've been trapped in How my apartment. How long did it take the whole process? of writing and shooting? Well, it's very diffused. I mean, I, the concept I introduced publicly in 2012, but I didn't obviously, you know, start right then. Yeah. Um, I would say if I had to condense it down, the film took probably about two and a half years in total. Um, but it uh, in that is thousands and thousands of hours. Um, it's almost mind boggling when I look back on it to see how much really suffering. Right? <laughs> how you suffered? It was just, it was too, by the time I realized what I had done, um, it, I, I'll be honest, actually, I probably wouldn't have completed the film if it wasn't for the fact that I had people support me through a crowd source, I did yeah. a crowd source called Indiegogo. Yeah. And if they, they hadn't have done that, I probably would have gotten in the middle of this and said, forget this, I'm, I'm gonna do something much easier. But, <laughs> do but you I had remember to what through. you told me in the gala the first time you saw me? No. <laughs> you told me to tell you to never do something like this again. <laughs> remind me, yeah, remind me never to do anything like this again. <laughs> or you sometimes you say something like, if I ever tell you I'm going to do something like this again, just talk me out of it. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure I told a lot of people that, in fact. <laughs> yes. You're That's... like going around telling people to remind you not to, <laughs> not to do this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> I, that, that was my state of mind. What well, still is my state no, of mind. No, I can way, imagine. But... I it's can... a learning curve. It's a learning curve. I mean, I, I got myself into it and I'm glad I'm happy with what came out of it, even though you can kind of feel the strain in the movie a little bit. But, um, you know, ambition is a torturous thing. I think uh, in my entire life, I've always pushed too far. And I don't say that as a compliment to myself. I've always, if I'm going to write something, I write something huge. If I'm going to, uh, everything I've done, I, I started a social movement, you know, I, I'm trying to change the world. Like it's, everything's huge in my world. <laughs> it's, it's, when, I was a mu when I was a professional musician, everything I did had to be huge. I had to do these huge pieces and it, it, it's just an ambitious problem. And I think it's a maturity issue, really in the sense that I've learned my lesson slowly not to, to basically harm my health by all these overly um, ambitious concepts. There's a, something well, to be said for minimalism. So, mm -hmm. you know, coming coming back to my future projects, I'm, I'm at least for a little while, <laughs> I'm going to try and you know be very straightforward and, and direct. And I might even bring back a web series of my own called Culture and Decline, which is a zero budget uh, parody 
uh, of a public access parody, they call it. I don't know if you have public access in Turkey, but in the United States, people would just put on their own little shows in their basement and it would be on something called public access oh, back no. in the day. It was like a channel that any random person could be a part of back when there was normal broadcast channels. Like um, YouTube. It, yeah, exactly. But it was a different phenomenon because you know, it had a certain feel to it when you watched a public access TV show, mm -hmm. as opposed to what people do on, on YouTube, at least now. So anyway, it's called Culture in Decline, but it, it's a very minimalistic idea. I might bring that back for fun um, in the meantime, as I work on other projects. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah. Well, as anyway. I said at the beginning, Interreflections is a one-man show. I mean, yeah. and I, and well, I take that as a compliment. Coupled with all the great talent, I mean, the, the four of you and then John and Simon characters, Greg and Mike, and then uh, Ariana DeMatteo, who wasn't an actress at all, who actually was someone that came to a, a job thing because I was looking for an assistant for a studio I was running. Mm -hmm. And she had this quality to her. And I was like, you want to be in a movie? <laughs> <laughs> And then, you know, she had done some simple modeling and such, but she just has that look. It didn't matter what her expressions really were. Uh, she just had this great look of fundamental confusion. And that's what she carries forward throughout all of those scenes, which I thought was a lot of fun. Uh, uh, that was, so anyway, all, all uh, seven of you, uh, really what kind of defined that film. So my appreciation goes out to all of you. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, well, it's, not really like anybody, it's not like anybody made a lot of money on any of this, including myself. So it's all, you know, people's commitment and being nice and, and believing in the project. That's the fun thing about this. All of you in, in personal discussions, yeah, we're not just looking at this as a professional, you know, advancement. Yeah. You actually appreciated what was being stated and that, yeah. that meant a lot to me. And that was what I was looking for. I mean, specifically for years, actually, that that had been what I've been looking for in my career. So, yeah, yeah. so when I got to the script, I was like, this one. Yeah. And initially, I actually thought I missed a deadline. Um, and then maybe you maybe the submission process went online again or something. And I was really happy because I had actually wrote it in my mind the the academics uh, it said the academics i was like oh i remember that project i was like i i think i missed the deadline and whatever and then i saw it again so i was like really really excited and and once i got the script i just i mean i didn't even have to think about it well i will i will tell you this you might this might frighten you to hear but i did have this conversation with charlene after the auditions when we were picking folks out particularly you and i was very concerned that you were basically living in a different country I mean, you know, anything could happen. It's, you know, you're suddenly, oh, I'm leaving for Turkey tomorrow for a while. And you basically pointed out that you live there. I didn't know that. In fact, I probably wouldn't have auditioned you if I knew that you were literally in Turkey. Because I, I was in know. Turkey when I was, yeah. yeah but yeah. Um, it was, but I was there already for, for the callback. I was actually there for a couple of other projects. I was there for a um, competition that was in Warner Bros. There was a Warner okay. Brothers showcase competition. And oh. I was lucky that you 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 sent me the callback requested it was like a couple of days after the competition itself so yeah. i was in la when you called me in for the callback but i had no idea you were gonna call me in so yeah there was a chance that i might not be there yeah, um, yeah. and then i and then after you were you were back in turkey I was like oh this is what all oh, so many things could go what wrong what is she I doing <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 for example, imagine if COVID happened right in the middle of that, I would, oh, yeah. no way I would have gotten you back to the States most likely. So anyway, but that didn't happen. So that's good. I would have, if there were flights, <laughs> I would have gotten on the flight. Trust me. You would, mean, have you, would, you would have been an essential worker. It takes a lot to stop me when I want to do something. So very good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, no, I was actually worried that that might be a concern for you because it's it's a legitimate concern so i think yeah, that yeah. that might be one of the obstacles that we had but um charlene did get get back to me about a couple of like logistical questions and then i answered her questions and i actually oh you don't know this yeah. i actually didn't think i was going to get the part after the audition the callback what made you think that i don't know i didn't think i did too well nah, i thought nah. it was all right but i didn't think it was great so i was yeah, on the way back, I was thinking and I was saying, huh, I have a good chance for the Warner Brothers competition, but the film, I don't think the film happened. <laughs> I remember thinking. No, that. you stood out immediately because of the div diversity and your execution was so natural. And again, you had the talent with the teleprompter, which was immediate. So it was a pretty clear cut. So, oh, well, good. Yeah. 
good to know. Yeah, very, well, very appreciative. It was a thrill to be Alenia for you. So <laughs> I, hope, I hope in the future we'll, we'll have other ventures to, to take together. Yeah. yeah. Do you have, uh, uh, what was I going to ask you? So in your, in your career, how many films have you been a part of as of now? Ah, uh, this is my first film. It's okay. And you, you mainly done writing and then, I mean, as an well, actress. My, my background as an actress is theater. I come from, theater. yeah, amateur theater since like I was nine. That's uh, great. But, um, That's actually good to know. I, I, I was literally requesting theater actors for this film because I knew that the abstraction of such, I don't know if I even said that. Did I comment on that in, in the pitch? Because uh, that's really interesting. That so you fit that profile well. But continue. <laughs> it's the first time I heard that. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I come from a theater background. I did like amateur theater all through uh, middle school and high school. I did theater in English. I was raised in the wow. capital city of Ankara, uh -huh. and um, there was the American Consulate Amateur Theater stage on the run. So I did musicals there. I did two musicals. And then I went to the United States for university. I went to Pepperdine University and um, B I have a BA in politics, actually, political science, well, good. Um, which is my more, um, is side, my side that's more interested in the current events. And I most of the time tried to like combine my artistic side, writing and acting side with my side that's interested in social impact and current events. Wow. Um, and I don't, don't like to execute my writing or acting side without any of the social impact or current event events context. Good. Otherwise Good. it just feels too empty for me. Yeah. Just I understand who, who I am. So that's yeah. why the interreflections was perfect for me. I well, was it's... seeking it out, literally Good. seeking it out. It um, speaks to the uh, the nature of the arts and our motivation. And do we yeah. make art just for the sake of art, just the sake for people to sit back and you know escape? There's a place for that, but there that's is. not what I do. I, I I want I think art whatever we spend time with in this short life, you got to have some kind of meaning to it. You just can't keep yeah. putting out the same, you know, storybook formulaic stuff. No, I agree. That's probably my biggest frustration, whether it's music or anything. Uh, there's there's not enough experimentation out there. You have you know especially in film, you have a certain core group that are still around, like David Lynch or Darren Aronofsky or or even, uh, well, yeah, the avant-garde doesn't really exist much. It's few and far between. And I'd say, you know, 1% of the known filmmakers out there really push the envelope and try to do something different. 1%? That's really low. I, I think so. I mean, I've, I, I, like anybody, I pay a lot of attention to what's happening. You have a lot of spectacular, you know, sensationalized and high profile, extremely high budget films that really push the envelope in terms of style. Yeah. Um, but conception, I think, is still very limited out there and social communication. You know, films that pretend to be socially conscious, they might frame it in a very vague way. You know, they might talk about racism, but within that, it's not really about social development. It's just a, a framework that they know is topical. You see that a lot today it's in modern film. Yeah, I know. I know exactly you, what you mean. Yeah, they, they're not really communicating anything important, but they know it's topical. It's like, a, it's just a trend. Uh, yeah. the, to be socially conscious and to be an activist has basically become trendy. Yeah. Um, and that's good on one level, obviously, but it, it's not very effective. And most so of the I, time, those films like commercialize the, the film as being like, uh, a women's rights film or a women's film like right. in Turkey or in, and globally we have this term now which is women's film and most of the time when I get a script that says it's women's film the message or the plot line or the character has nothing to do with women's rights or right. you know right. had, uh, or a woman or what she goes through it's most of the time just a woman protagonist going through the same exact thing that she would go through if it wasn't a woman's film in in the same manner or yes. even in a negative light. So if you're gonna put right. a woman in a negative light in the society, that's not a woman's film. <laughs> that's good point. Good that's, point. That's a man's film with a woman protagonist. So. Exactly. Very good point. Well, that's also a good comment uh, as far as inner reflections, the, the fact that I used only women for the academics of the future. That mm -hmm. had a symbolic nature, obviously, because yeah. in the history of patriarchal society, 
women have been demeaned and they have been considered in, uh, intellectually inferior. I mean, and that's something that people got mad at me a little bit. They say, well, is this, what is this feminism you're trying to put forward? Well, first of all, it's not feminism per se. It's an artistic decision to express the fact that we have to really home in on the fact that gender equality along with other things really needs to be taken more into account. But yeah. I, also par I also parallel it with a certain satire because the dominant figures are still men. I did that because that is still sadly the state of affairs in the general uh, outlay. So there's a lot of contradictory things in the film like that too. But uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of interesting how people become so polarized in, in the That's political funny. discussion. That's funny, yeah. people actually came to you with that commentary saying that it was a feminist choice. Well, I don't know if you've noticed this, but for some bizarre reason, the white male has decided he's the most oppressed figure in the world now, at least in the United <laughs> States. I mean, there's a, really, there's a in this this kind of incel reality. I don't know if you're familiar with these subcultures of crazy men that are just gone berserk and they don't understand the history. And so that's being in the United States, you have this kind of subculture and probably, well, no, it exists everywhere. I'll take that back. You know, that you have this fundamental uh, victimization that you're seeing across the world in many ways on the part of the effectively the oppressors that have been running the show for so many centuries. But I wanted to counter that in a few different ways. But that's kind of the tip of the iceberg for the reflections. I just, you know, the framing of it was to use these sort of symbols, but it was really the content that made it. Um, so it, it goes speaking to your point, in other words, it wasn't just a vague symbolic film. Hey, there's a woman empowerment film because she's acting like a man and she's a superhero. Um, or yeah, anyway, I, I definitely, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'm sorry. I, you go um, it really disappoints me when they actually do those with historical films too. When yeah. they use like a military context, it really pisses me off because if you commercialize your film as if it's say, you know, some movement film or some right. military actions film, and but you, what you're doing is actually using that plot instead of having to go through the difficult process of creating a plot yourself, you're using right. a lot of what happened for whatever you have in your mind. Right. I think that's, that's really hurtful because the people, the characters that you choose to use for your own imaginary message are people mm -hmm. who actually lived and suffered and you don't have any right to take their plot or their names to use right. your message for. Just yeah, create sure. a different military situation or a different world. Right. Good point. Uh, that really pisses me off because <laughs> period pieces and um, I'm a, I, I like war history and sure. there's a lot of very difficult and painful scars in our history of the world for all of us. And it just, I don't see it viable when filmmakers use certain plots where I think is, is a disservice to, to I, what happened yeah. or the message. I know exactly what you mean. They create a, um, a new sort of narrative with existing information. Yes, That's why, is. to be prefer perfectly honest, I don't watch biopics, biography fo yeah. films, because inevitably Hollywood or someone gets too creative and they decide to reset history. If you watch, for example, um, the biopic on Dr. Martin Luther King, mm -hmm. whom I respect and have read a great deal, it's a terrible depiction. It, it, they exaggerate all of this nonsense around his life and even reinvent history. And if some poor kid, some student watches this movie, they're going to think this is actually the history of Dr. Martin Luther King. So yeah, I completely agree with you. It's just exploitation based on this trend, once again, of activism. It's become, is... And you see, you see it in TV shows. I mean, how many shows now are featuring racism and things, but not really in a proactive way. They're just doing it to exploit the current environment. Or, you know, even when Occupy Wall Street happened, I remember seeing a Nissan truck commercial where they're running the truck through all these activists as if they're, you know, a part of Occupy. It was preposterous. Uh, the hijacking, basically, of, of this new kind of activist thinking. Um, but that's just what commercial society does. And that's a whole nother conversation that we can talk yeah, about probably another time. Uh, commercial society continually degrades what uh, viable and, and, and genuine artistic communication uh, needs to be it just makes it polluted yeah um, it's become very difficult actually well it's not become it's always been maybe it's getting easier or hopefully it's getting easier to put out there genuine artistic you know filmmaking or other other you know art forms uh, because of the commercial um, nature to it it's actually very sure. difficult i found it very difficult to combine the commercial side to the genuine side because yep. most of the time one gets 
you know, more of the show than the other. And if that's the case, you know, if you want to go more genuine than you, as you said, you have no budget and it's very difficult to make the film because filmmaking is a very difficult art form. It, it's, it's like a surgery. You have all these many, many, many different pieces that you have to put together and it does take labor and labor takes, I mean, costs money. So, yep. Yep. but if you want to go with the commercial, you have to go with the commercial side, then you have to tone down or just even choose a different content to to the one that yeah. you want to make so yeah i have a new project as i mentioned a documentary it's going to be about advertising but not exactly advertising it's going to be about marketing and what consumer marketing culture has done to civilization mm -hmm. because there's a trajectory where many organic novel and uh, you know sincere things that have been executed in the media They've been continually hijacked and polluted, as I said before, where suddenly films are, you know, have product placement. Uh, suddenly you, like for example, another thing that's even more atrocious that borders on this, the popularity in parallel, you don't know how many actresses and actors I, I, I auditioned for the film. And they said they were worried because they didn't have a big social media following. So literally we're casting people for social media following of the actors just because they already have a commercial audience effectively so it just pollutes and pollutes and pollutes I'm, do have you ever run into that like oh she's not she doesn't have enough instagram followers we can't hire her Does, oh, have you ever had that I was gonna, that's why i came closer to the screen i was going to whisper something to you oh, okay. <laughs> if, I'm, shh, if i'm most of the time unemployed or if i'm ever unemployed it's because of my social media <laughs> Yeah, it's horrible. It's just so terrible. But anyway, it, it, the whole film, in other words, is about how we've we've just perverted the sincerity so much in everything that we do. And it's yeah. just gotten worse and worse and worse. And and marketing and advertising has become formulaic, where it's not even a product anymore. It's a formula in, in the sense of the structures, as we, we touched upon earlier, where you can't deviate from these general structures in film or TV. And, and you know, most of uh, most um, most uh, networks, or I should say production studios, they, they just respect the formula. They won't allow anything new. Mm -hmm. So it's just a giant complaint of the holistic culture. We're so bombarded with status, marketing, vanity oriented values, and it's been absorbed into, excuse me, it's been, it's manipulated everything we do because everyone has to walk around thinking about the commercial viability of everything at all times. You go to Instagram or social media, these aren't organic photos in most cases. These aren't organic situations. These are people that are communicating because they want to fit a profile in order to gain access through their popularity. And that's probably another you know, good subject that needs to be explored more so is the cultural effects of social media. Um, it creates yeah. an artificial entity. Artificial people are being just sort of generated and, and as the, another, another level of this, just to you know, finish the point, because of the internet, your identity is pretty much what it appears online and that's it. Like you're not real anymore. It's just what you appear to be. And that speaks to what's called uh, society of the spectacle. You might remember that scene in the bar and in the reflections mm -hmm. with the guy at the counter that does the drugs and eventually kills himself as he watches the smiley face on the screen while the other character reads the book called uh, spe excuse me. Yeah, Society of the Spectacle by Debord which is a very old and excellent uh, book, poetry book uh, about the commercialization of reality. He wrote, I believe in the forties, maybe earlier than that. And he, he was prophetic to say that all, all our, our lives are becoming symbols. We're no longer real. What we represent and what we do is based on this transference of an idealized symbology, this, this living spectacle where we just sort of, everything is just a TV show to us. It, yeah. Really interesting, interesting stuff. That's become actually one of the most difficult sides of my career, to be honest. That's become one of the most difficult sides of acting. I mean, not the craft, not, you know, going into a very deep emotion and then staying there. That's not mm -hmm. the most difficult side of acting. The most difficult it has become to be someone, to, to be a shop with a showroom. That's yes. basically what it is. That's basically what social media is for my profession is that I have to be on the sh in the showroom all the time with a with a with a with a vision of what people want to see or what not even people what numbers want to see and I'm right. going to be cast and I'm go going to get a job according to that and it's very difficult I'm one of those people I don't know but it's very difficult for me to separate myself from my work Mm -hmm. So when I'm working and when I'm, you know, when I have my public side, it's still me. 
So it's very difficult yeah. for me to separate the showroom from myself. So yeah, I don't even I don't even try. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even well, try. I'm being forced to. Because I know. I know. Believe me, I get it. I've gotten a lot of criticism just for being who I am, and I'm not playing some professional game. Um, yeah. And I'm actually surprised I've had any success whatsoever because I just simply refuse to conform to any of it. Mm -hmm. But so it goes. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very strange uh, evolution of, of human society right now, and I, I'm curious to see uh, what the next few decades hold, that's for sure. Um, so. I, I was discussing this topic with a friend just a couple of days ago, and she was saying how um, the effects of social media, we're just going to know in a decade or so, it's just going to be like cigarettes. Yeah. What? Uh, when yeah. we knew their side effects a lot later than society started using them and social well, media is just going to be exactly the same. I'm said. glad you brought that up. You, you remember the scene in Interreflections Interreflection, where they throw the cigarettes at the, at the cardboard cutout. That's yeah. precisely the addiction and the sickness. They're, they menacingly look at her, her symbol, because that's what she is at that point. Mm -hmm. And then they just start smoking and then they get angry and have to throw the em emoji cigarette packs at her, which is probably one of my favorite scenes, I'll be honest. That, even though it's it's so unorthodox, but it's one of my favorite abstract scenes in the film. Um, it really captures, I think, the spirit of what social media has done in that detachment of, of yeah. who we are versus with the symbology that we represent. But yeah, I couldn't agree more. And, and the worst thing is it's, it's a part of people's personal lives. I mean, with work, with the showroom thing, yeah, it's, it's out there and it's general, but people, make a life for themselves within their personal lives too. Like they use it within their relationships to, to, sh to make a different personality for themselves within their relationships, their real sure. relationships, so. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's, uh, it's, it's an all encompassing, I think. <laughs> That's true, it's all encompassing. It, again, that goes back to this film that I'm working on now in the preliminary stages. It's called, it's called A World Without Advertising, which is the lure. Mm -hmm. And I begin with just the concept of what advertising has evolved from its history and then what it's and then moving on, of course, to the marketization and commodification of everything. And people today can't see the difference. They can't see the difference between a, a truly novel, original person or thought and a marketing gimmick or ploy or something to sell. It's it's really deep when you think about what commercial commercial reality has done to people, which is yet another reason why this kind of economic system needs to go away. We shouldn't be living in a world where everyone has to strive for status and posture in order to get jobs. Um, <laughs> it's just, it's disheartening. It, this isn't what, what humans are. Um, there's so many beautiful potentials that we have and our range of variability is such that I have no doubt we could live in a highly collaborative world. You, know, yeah. you still have the dynamics of competition because there's an element of that in us too. But it all comes down to what the social system is rewarding. And coming full circle with this conversation, we got to figure out a way to get our friends and peers and the family of Earth to uh, realize that the games we're playing are not gonna are not gonna work out. I mean, you we know we know what's gonna happen. The walls are gonna close in on the ecological level, and then you're gonna get mass conflict they both are. domestically, internationally. You're gonna have climate refugees on the borders of Europe and other rich nations. And it's just, you're, it's terrible, the trajectory. And there's no one out there that can tell me that we have some glamorous future awaiting us right now, yeah. even though we definitely could because all the fruits of science and technology, so much abundance potential, as I talk about in the film too. Um, there's so much great potential, but we have to- and We only have 10 years left to have any impact on the climate change. I mean, after 10 years- it, It's debatable, yeah. I, some say we're already past the point of no return in terms of the long-term effects where, where the, the drying out of certain regions and the flooding of other regions is just simply inevitable. We can't reverse it. it would, it's, just, it, it's just in motion. Even if everyone stops carbon emissions or general pollution right now, the damage is already done to a very strong degree. Uh, obviously, we have to still be motivated to stop it. But um, anyway, <laughs> not to be a doomsday guy. Try not to doomsday. <laughs> yes, let's, let's finish it on a, on a higher note. Yes, I'm, I'm ultimately positive in the way, in the, in the in potentials are there. And if people can understand the potentials and not get so hung up on their identities and their groupism and their fears um, and just sort of stop and, you know, take a deep breath and realize that living minimalistically and living holistically with a consciousness towards 
you know, seeing other people be happy and survive as opposed to the opposite, which we do today, and seeing the spiritual, the spiritual reality of, of realizing that you live in a habitat that you were born out of, and maybe, just maybe we should take care of the habitat that created us. Seems logical to me. I don't know. It, Hopefully it we can get people to understand. When you put it like that, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. So well, I hope, lots of, uh, anyway. I hope we, we get, could talk, get, we, get there. We one. could talk forever, I'm sure. I know, we, we really can. Um, we already found two other subjects to, to talk on, a, on another day. Social yes. Media and, and period pieces. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Well, all right, Selena, it's been oh, a really honor, a great honor to speak with you again. Thank you for and your I, time. Yeah, it's yes. it great seeing you for after a very long time. I know, I know. Well, I look forward if you come back to the States, obviously, let's grab lunch or something. So. After the crisis, definitely. I, yeah. I will be there and hopefully we'll, we'll get rolling on my career over there. Yeah, but I, I'm serious about a possible theatrical in, in Istanbul. I have other friends in Istanbul too. Mm. It would be a lot, of, a lot of fun actually to figure yeah. that out. Um, I'm not, I feel like my prior film series had a fairly strong reaction in Turkey too. So there's mm -hmm. probably still kind of an audience there. Yes, um, there is. I, have a, yeah. I have a lot of audience around me. I have a lot of fans around me in my family and, and with my colleagues who actually want to be a part of the film. Um, oh, yeah. That's nice. Good to know. Good to know. Well, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much and see you soon. Okay. Bye bye. bye. Well, that's going to be a bunch for your friends to transcribe. I know what me to do it. I hope they will ask me to do it. You know, there's services uh, <clears throat> where you can upload a video and they will transcribe everything for you in one wow. language. And then you can tell them to do it in another one. So you, you could probably get it done for professionally. I do that for my podcasts. Okay. To do the English transcription for 30 minutes is about $40, you know. And if you wanted to get it put in another language, it's probably about $100. Yeah. But anyway, I see you're still recording, but... Uh, I I'm gonna... still, that's what I was looking at. How do I stop recording? I don't know. Oh, I say stop. Am I going to lose it if I say stop? It would be horrible if we lose the recording. You shouldn't. I, it should know to record it. Yeah. Stop recording. <laughs>